Um, if you've been to a manufacturer of electronics, for example, our stable mates in Marantz or Denon, if they're making circuit boards, they're typically using what's called a hot solder bath, where you roll the board through and it emerges all tagged and soldered up. Now, we're not doing that because we don't do it in enough quantity to justify it. Also because, I don't know how much you know about crossover design, but typically the amount of components that we put on a typical crossover board, pretty limited. So we solder everything by hand. So the guys working over there on their individual build stations are working on making these and putting these together. This is not in my hand, my hand right now, of course, is an 805. As you can see, it's a relatively simple crossover. In fact, in this particular product, we've got a grand total of one, two, three, four main component elements. It's about as simple as it gets, right? Now, we're in a fortunate position. And again, hopefully something that you know, but I think it's something that's worth emphasizing back to customers, right? A lot of loudspeaker brands don't make or design their own drive units. They buy them from other people. And as a result, from the point of view of crossover design, those crossover engineers are having to work around some of the inherent characteristics and potentially some of the inherent problems in how those drive units behave. We're in a very fortunate position. I mean, if we don't understand how those drive units work, nobody will, right? As a result, we can design, relatively speaking, quite simple crossover topography. We don't need to use very many elements to change how those drive units behave and to bring them into the appropriate alignment. Now, the reason that counts is this is an electrical circuit. And there is no electrical circuit in the world that was ever improved by having more stuff in it. So the shorter and simpler this is, the more likely the music gets from here to where we want it to go. So we deliberately choose simple. This is a first order crossover with four components in it from an 805. Even when you get up to the big guy, like an 801, it's first on the high frequency, second in and out in the mid, third on the LF. Very, very straightforward and very few parts. There's another good reason why that works, of course. If you have fewer components, you can choose to associate more money with those components. So, as you probably are aware, but just in case you aren't, something like this, Mondorf Supreme, is an incredibly expensive capacitor. So, this area right here is where we manufacture, um, obviously, everything for Nautilus, because it's a relatively limited thing, but it's also where we manufacture spares. So, you can see right near, for example, we're holding older, holding older cones. You've got a seven-inch Kevlar from quite some time ago, for example. We haven't used that for a period. And this is part of our stock of spare parts. But if we get beyond that, we can look at trying making something. I hope you all know it, but just to be clear, the Diamond Dome tweeter, it genuinely is a synthetically grown diamond. This is very, very fragile, as I'm sure you know. As you can feel, it's also incredibly light. So it's 40 micron, which is about three human hair in terms of thickness. It's 88 milligrams which is not very much. This is actually slightly heavier than that because it's on a voice coil, but I put it on a voice coil because it's just easier to handle it, essentially speaking. So, these guys right here are taking these domes and then they are assembling it up into the complete diaphragm mounting plate, tube loading system, and the solid body tweeter assembly to create our completed tweeter ready to go on downstairs. This is the former, the substrate that we grow the diamond dome onto. So we'd have a tray of several hundred of these. Now there's a company local to us about 40 miles from here called Element 6. They're part of the De Beers group, the diamond company, and they specialize in typically producing industrial diamonds for things like mining, deep sea mining drills. They also have the necessary reactors, genuinely they're like reactors, the chambers that are needed to create the process of chemical vapor deposition or CBD that we use for this. So, trays of hundreds of these go into the, the chamber. It's superheated, it's highly pressurized, and then we inject a gaseous cloud, a plasma cloud, that contains microscopic particles of carbon, carbon, into the top of the chamber. And then over the course of about six hours, we gradually reduce the temperature and the pressure. And the carbon particles begin to descend. And as they begin to descend, they change in state chemically from carbon to diamond. As they cool, they form this thin frost or membrane over the surface, and eventually what you're left with is your little fragment of 40 micron thin 
diamond dome. I pre-broke this, so don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, if you look at the bottom of it, guys, you can see that it clearly looks like carbon. Chemically, it actually is diamond. However, we are aware of the fact that somebody who didn't know would look at it, they say that looks like carbon. So to help that illusion, it gets a uniform outer coating, which is platinum. And that just goes over, sorry, I'm showing oh, no, rather than giving. That just goes over the top right now. The only reason for that is otherwise without that, it looks that. like that, yeah? yeah? yeah, yeah. Um, second part of how we mount it into the system is that. That's the tube loading system, the tweeter on top assembly. So that is milled from one of these. This is way heavy, okay? Way heavier than what you just felt. Um, just to be clear, as I said before, we don't do stuff like machining metal on site. That comes to us from a supplier. However, one of my colleagues sourced the billet of metal just to give you guys a sense of what it actually comes from. So that is cut as a single piece from that. There's no welds, there's no joints, there's no solder, there's no anything. That is machined as solid from that. I want you to imagine right now that what you have in your hand is a flashlight. So the, out, the diameter across the front end of it is the lens of the flashlight, right? Okay, if you turn your flashlight on, turn it on, there we go, and we're going to point it at the wall over there. What happens over there? Yeah, so we're throwing a ton of light on the wall from that distance, okay? What I want you to do now is take your hands and put it around the edges of your flashlight. Just like that. Now point it at the wall. What happens to the light on the wall? Smaller circle. We reduce the amount of light output onto the wall. Translate that into the audio, and as he quite correctly said, that's the exact same thing in audio. The cabinet and everything around it has an effect on how much energy reaches the wall, whether it's light, in the case of the flashlight, or audio in the case of a loudspeaker. And again, does that help explain the point, what it is? So putting this assembly like this means that we are maximizing, well done, the audio that we get from our domes and minimizing the amount of waste that we get throwing it into the cabinet. So that shape's there for a very good reason. Same point, you've all just held it in your hands, right? Yeah? You can also now figure out why we don't put it in a $500 loudspeaker. Yeah? yeah. It gets deployed where we can. So now 50% of 700 series, every 800, obviously Nautilus, some premium vehicles, but you don't find that in the entry level stuff. In the entry level stuff, we use different approaches. So the dome, when it's in position, is gonna be right here on the end of that, and the energy from the dome is gonna be down, down that tube. Do you know why? Correct. He's been to lots of classes, I like him. So, back of a cabinet, front of a cabinet, drive unit. As the drive unit's moving this way, it's making sound. As it moves this way, it's putting air pressure into the cabinet. The more it moves, the larger it is, the more the air pressure builds up. You get to the point where that air pressure starts to provide a compressed air space that is pushing back against the drive unit, right? And that influences how that drive unit's behaving. So the solution from the Nautilus is you take the back of the cabinet and you move it away from the back of the drive unit. And you allow the energy from the back of the drive unit to dissipate down a tube length. The larger the cone, the longer the tube length. Which is why a Nautilus has a tube, which is this long right at the bottom, because it's the end of a big old 12 inch. And I don't know the length in feet, but in meters it's three and a half meters. Which is pretty long, right? So this check is hugely important. And you find this in everything. What I'm trying to say is the Diamond Dome, we can only afford it for certain speakers. This, we can only afford it for certain speakers. Tube loading, everything. Installed stuff in ceilings, car doors, 600 series, 700 series. They will all have it in some way, shape or form.